This episode of Epicenter is brought to you by Microsoft Azure. Do you have an idea for a blockchain app but are worried about the time and cost it will take to develop? The new Azure Blockchain Dev Kit is a free download that brings together the tools you need to get your first app running in less than 30 minutes. Learn more at aka.ms slash epicenter. Hi, welcome to Epicenter. My name is Sebastian Couture. And my name is Ryan Fabian Craig. So today we're going to have uh, Ethan Bachman on and Sanya Agarwal. Ethan is the co-founder of Tenement. He's also a vice president of the Interchain Foundation. And of course, Sunny is a co-host with us at Epicenter, and he's a research scientist at uh, the Tenement team. Now, quite obviously, there's this uh, sort of tight interconnection between Epicenter and Cosmos. And so we just want to point it out so you guys have the right context. So first of all, um, Sonny is obviously a co-host of Epicenter as well as an employee at Tenement, and he's also running a Cosmos validator. So please be aware of that. Then when it comes to myself, I obviously I used to be an employee at uh, the Tenement company as well. Uh, I also hold Adams personally, and I've been building a validator called Course One, and so working on Cosmos uh, from that perspective. So also take that into account that I'm sort of you know on both sides in this in this instance. Uh, additionally, uh, you know this validator course one and building it together with Meher. I mean, he's not hosting this episode, but he's of course also a co-host of Epicenter. And then Cosmos is also a sponsor. So they're not sponsoring this episode, but they're sponsoring the Epicenter podcast. So we just wanted to point that out. Another thing I would point out is that I also hold Atoms and I've been very you know, sort of closely following the Cosmos project and course one. So I have some insights there. And so we should also want to apologize about uh, some of the noise. So there was a little bit of construction going on in, in, in Sunny's vicinity. So uh, hopefully we'll get some of that out, but uh, apologies uh, for that background noise. So without further delay, here's our interview with Sunny Agarwal and Ethan Buckman. So we're here today with Ethan Buckman and Sunny Agarwal. Ethan is the uh, co-founder of the Cosmos and Tenement Projects and Sunny is uh, a researcher, a uh, research scientist at All In Bits, which is the parent company of Tendermint, and is also a host here on Epicenter. Uh, hi, guys. Hey, thanks for having us on. It's uh, exciting to be on wearing the uh, guest hat, finally. It's kind of been my dream ever since joining the blockchain space, so happy to finally be here doing it. Yeah, good to be back. Thanks, guys. Yeah, so so of course, we've uh, done some podcasts on Cosmos before. We did one with Jay about, I guess it's now two years ago. So that was just around the, the, the fundraiser. Um, and, you know, we'll link to that. I think that was a great episode. And actually, I think still mostly current. But for for those who, you know, aren't super familiar with Cosmos, let's spend like a few minutes just giving like a high level introduction. So maybe, Ethan, what's what's the vision of Cosmos? And, you know, how would you describe Cosmos? Sure. So I think I think the vision of Cosmos um, is kind of analogous to the original vision of of the Internet in the sense that um, when the Internet started coming around, we already had a large number of, uh, you know, small networks and the Internet was proposing a way to actually interconnect them all through a common set of protocols like TCP. Um, and so in the same way that the Internet, you know, enabled this interoperability between many existing networks and, and networks that were still to come. Um, the idea with Cosmos is to, is to be the kind of interchain, right? So the uh, the interoperability layer between you know existing blockchains and the many new blockchains to come, and a sort of part of that not only you know not only is the goal of Cosmos to define these kind of interchain standards, but also to define um, to define more modern and mature approaches to actually building the individual chains themselves. And so that's where things like Tendermint, this general purpose consensus engine, comes in. Things like the Cosmos SDK, which is a framework for building applications on Tendermint. Uh, and then, of course, IBC, which is the, the key kind of interoperability piece that enables these different blockchains um, to actually communicate with one another. Yeah, really, it was like meant to like kind of um, we, we see it as this like third generation blockchain. And I know that term is like very cliched and like overused quite a bit. But um, I think that most of the other things that call themselves third generation blockchains aren't don't really quite fit the mantle. They really just seem to be continuing the second generation. And. So what I mean by when I say second generation is it's this like, uh, 
era of blockchains who are trying to do this like Turing complete VM, one chain to rule them all kind of system. So in like the first generation, we had Bitcoin and Namecoin and Saya and all these separate blockchains that were kind of independent and doing their own thing and like had their own applications, Bitcoin for money, Namecoin for DNS, etc. Ethereum came along and sort of did two main things, right? It, what, the first thing it did was it made it easy for different applications to talk to each other. So, you know, on Ethereum, I could go and use my, I can use my CryptoKitty on Xerox to buy some DAI, right? Like it has this nice composability between different applications on the Ethereum system. And the other thing it did was it made it very easy for uh, developers to write their applications, right? So it, back in generation one, really, if you wanted to write a blockchain application, your best, easiest way to do so was essentially to fork the Bitcoin code base, which is this like, you know, spaghetti code, C++, very difficult to reason about. Uh, the consensus is kind of intermingled with the state machine, intermingled with P2P, especially post SegWit. Um, and so like, Ethereum Solidity is like, you know, Solidity is not the nicest language in the world, but it's definitely, it was, it was way easier for people to write applications than, the, than forking the Bitcoin code base. But, you know, and so I, I, well, you know, I like this like analogy to compare it to like the history of like human development, which is, you know, if in the first generation, you can think of that as like kingdoms and like, uh, villages where you have like these separate kingdoms and villages that don't really have the ability to like, you know, they can't really trade or anything. Like some people working on atomic swaps. Um, Ethereum kind of created an empire. What empires did was they, through mass political integration, they allowed for mass eco economic integration. You allowed people from like, you know, Italy to trade with people in Persia because they were all under a common rule of law and dictator. And this, you know, it, it led to economic integration, but it also came with a lot of drawbacks of empires, namely things like, you know, uh, heavy taxation on its user, on its uh, citizens, um, just a lack of social scalability and like governance that manages to take, like, you know, accept, like take in the viewpoints of all of the uh, stakeholders and whatnot. And so, you know, in the last hundred years in humanity, we had this like great thing where what we did was we shifted from like empires to nation states and city states. Uh, we allowed for mass economic integration in today's world with global trade, the internet, uh, free trade zones, but we don't have, we, we allowed it to break down into smaller political entities. And that's kind of like the vision of Cosmos as well is can we have those benefits that that second generation of blockchains did, namely the ease of use and the like, integration while still keeping the sovereignty of the first generation of blockchains. So to what extent do you guys feel that the Cosmos, I mean, originally the Cosmos white paper was published in uh, 2016, right? like somewhere in the summer, fall 2016. So it's been quite a while. Has the Cosmos vision evolved and changed in that time? Or do you guys feel it's largely stayed the same? Bucky can probably answer this a little bit better because, you know, he was there around back when it was started. But, you know, from from the I've been in, involved with the project in only for only about a year and a half now or close approaching two years now. But I, I would say definitely over time, I think the vision of, you know, the vision of Cosmos has always sort of been the same, but sort of our messaging and stuff and kind of it's, it's adapted uh, looking at some of the changes in the blockchain space, especially, you know, Cosmos uh, or the Tendermint project kind of started almost simultaneously with Ethereum. And so a lot of the thinking that we've done has kind of shifted as we saw the Ethereum ecosystem develop and see what kind of use cases people were interested in. Um, yeah, maybe Bucky can answer a bit more. Yeah, I think I think um, the high level vision is very much um, still the same. It hasn't really changed from the perspective of, um, you know, uh, there's gonna be many blockchains in the world uh, and that's that's right and that's fine. Uh, we want these blockchains to have kind of independent state machines that are defined, you know, according to the needs of their users and their stakeholders. Um, we want them to be relatively sovereign so that they're controlled and governed by their users and their stakeholders. Um, and we want them to all be interoperable so that there's some some standards through which they can still um, communicate with each other. And in the short term, you know, the kind of easiest, lowest hanging fruit was, OK, uh, we could define, um, you know, token transfers between these between these change. But in the long term, if, if we define things well enough and, you know, with advances in cryptography and crypto economic design and so on, you know, we could do more general purpose um, data exchange. And so 
that that kind of high level vision really hasn't hasn't changed at all. I mean, what what has changed is the particulars of the implementation detail as the you know as as the ecosystem of, of blockchains and, and blockchain engineering has evolved, and new users are coming in, and new applications are being found. Um, you know, all of that is kind of evolving uh, uh, in tandem. Um, you know, as new cryptography comes out, we're updating. Oh, you know, this could be used to make IBC more efficient, or you know, whatever. So. Uh, the high level vision i would say has been has been relatively the same and i hope is actually grounded in a kind of a timeless approach to building um to building systems and so you know ought to never change uh, to some extent um but you know of course the particular details of how we go about it i mean the cosmos white paper had no notion of the cosmos sdk for instance right um and so the cosmos sdk has kind of become a big part of of the ecosystem now and that you know there's a lot of particular um, details about how that was built and what's in it and what's not and so on we can talk about that later but uh, from a high level, I think things have been have stayed, you know, quite stable. So, Sunny, you, you mentioned this this idea of third generation blockchain, and I think it's safe to put uh, a project like Polkadot uh, in this category as well. And I think also by extension, uh, the vision for Ethereum 2.0 could also fit in this category. Um, starting with Polkadot, can you describe the fundamental, you know, philosophical differences between Cosmos and Polkadot. Sure. So I think uh, I would say pro one of the main primary philosophical differences between Cosmos and Polkadot is that Cosmos takes a sovereign first, sovereign by default approach, where we assume chains are sovereign, have their own validator sets, have their own security models, and allow them to sort of communicate and interoperate with each other. And we don't assume that there's any one, like our design for IBC is designed such that, you know, there could be any, uh, any two chains could talk to each other. There's no necessarily any root chain or anything like that. Well, Polkadot takes the approach where it like kind of does shared security by the by default, and that's kind of what they really focus on, uh, where they kind of say that like there is this one root relay chain, and then you you know all these other chains are going to be just like uh, shared secure using the validator set of that relay chain, and so you know and then they you know have the concept of connecting to other chains, but they, they using bridge zones, but that's really not like by default, people use the relay chain. While in Cosmos, um, by default, they're sovereign. But then the Cosmos hub, as well as, you know, there's other hubs and hub systems in the in the Cosmos interchain. But um, these chains will offer services such as, like, shared security and whatnot. But these are, like, optional things that uh, chains can opt into while it's not the, like, default or requirement. Okay. I mean, I, I, the way I see Polkadot in that, in that respect is I see it as sort of this validation as a service uh, for blockchains and 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 Cosmos, at least right now, doesn't have that functionality. Do you think this is something that uh, projects will want? So, for example, you know, if you're building a new blockchain and you're choosing a platform on which you you want to build your your application, you know, having that ability and having that functionality and that feature to bootstrap your application using a shared security model might be attractive to someone or to a project. Do you think that this is something that, you know, people will ask and will require of Cosmos at some point that sort of the, 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 the market and the ecosystem will, uh, will want as a functionality? Yeah, totally. I think that this is like what, what people absolutely want this. And this is kind of, what the goal of the Cosmos hub is in the long term. So I think it's more fair rather than comparing Polkadot to like the Cosmos network, Cosmos interchain idea. Uh, Cosmos hub versus Polkadot is really the like, you know, a more salient uh, comparison. And so there, and then, you know, the Cosmos hub has a design for, or I, I have a design for the Cosmos hub uh, shared security system that's slightly different than the Polkadot design. And so, you know, I've discussed it with the, uh, with a lot of the Polkadot, uh, dev teams and, you know, we're, we're both aware of each other's shared security designs. And, you know, maybe if you want, we could go into, uh, some of that, like some of how I, I, I plan for the shared security of Cosmos hub to work, but yeah. So essentially my point is, yes, the, 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 the shared security is something that will definitely de be demanded by a lot of, uh, projects. And that is one of the primary services that the Cosmos hub will provide to the Cosmos interchain network. And what about Ethereum in that case? I mean, I know it's, it's much earlier in terms of the maturity of Ethereum 2.0, 2.0, 2.1, 2.2, 2.3, 2.4, 2.5, 2.6, 2.7, 2.8, 2.9, 2.10, 2.11, 2
But I think that a lot of the fundamentals are there for you know, leading Ethereum into this, as you describe it, this blockchain 3.0 space. Can you already sort of discern some of the differences between what the vision is there and the Cosmos vision? Sure. So Ethereum still takes very much a like, you know, a uh, single VM, like single state machine. Everyone has to use the EVM. And, you know, really the problem with that is it suffers from a lot of like, you know, it, it's going to suffer from a lot of governance issues where people are going to basically have like different requirements from the from this VM and they're not going to be able to decide who gets what going into that VM. Um, and, you know, we already see this where there's like hundreds of EIPs that are open in this in the, in the EIP repo, the Ethereum improvement proposals. And some of them are contradictory. And like, you know, some people want state rent, some people don't. Some people want X, some people don't. Like, it's like there's so many like different design requirements and like the problem with the Ethereum complete VM is it really forces everyone to like use the average use case. You know, an example I like to use is if you want to build a payment system, you should probably be using UTXOs. Like there's a reason Bitcoin did that. They're, they're, they're just way better for like parallelization and like efficiency. But if you're building a payment system on top of Ethereum, you are stuck. You're ha you have to use their like account model. And that inc involves using the sequence numbers and you, you lose out on a lot of parallelization. And so you don't get that, you know, just like in the world of nation states where like splitting it off, it allowed nations to specialize. We also want to allow blockchains to specialize in use cases. This episode of Epicenter is brought to you by Microsoft and the Azure Blockchain Workbench. Getting your blockchain from the whiteboard to production can be a big undertaking. And something as simple as connecting your blockchain to IoT devices or existing ERP systems is a project in itself. Well, the folks at Microsoft have you covered. You already know about the Azure Blockchain Workbench and how easy it makes bootstrapping your blockchain network pre-configured with all the cloud services you need for your enterprise app. Their new development kit is the IFTTT for blockchains. Suppose you want to collect data from someone in a remote location via SMS and have that data packaged in a transaction for your Hyperledger Fabric blockchain. The development kit allows you to build this integration in just a few steps in a simple drag and drop interface. Here's another great example. Perhaps you're an institution working with Ethereum and rely on CSV files sent by email. One click in the dev kit and you can parse these files and have the data embedded in transactions. Whatever you're working with, the dev kit can read, transform, and act on the data. To learn more and to build your first application in less than 30 minutes, visit aka.ms slash epicenter. And be sure to follow them on Twitter at MSFT Blockchain. We'd like to thank Microsoft and Azure for their support of Epicenter. So the, the Cosmos project has been in, you know, in development in some way or another for a long time, right? Tenement, I think, was originally started in 2014. Now, just a, just a few weeks ago, we finally had the launch of the Cosmos app. So congratulations. Of course, it did take a little bit longer than, uh, <laughs> than announced. Like talk a little bit through, you know, kind of the process of getting to launch. Why did it end up taking so much longer? And like, how do you feel? How do you guys feel that launch went? Launch seems to have gone really well. Um, so I don't know if, if, if you've watched the video or if you were there at the live stream. Um, that was pretty cool. I mean, there was a moment, I think it was block 17. You know, Jack was hosting the live stream and, and we halted at block 17 and his face, just like all the color drained out of his face. <laughs> Quite a quite a moment. I think at Halloween, someone dressed up as Block Seventeen just to just to troll Jack. Um, but it seems it seems the launch went quite well. Um, you know, we had this decentralized start, which was pretty cool. Um, you know, quite a decentralized start actually. And then you know, um, the arguable kind of how you how you look at what's happened since then. Um, but I think you know we're, we're quite excited about about um, you know the fact that it's live and it's working, and uh, you know there's lots of interesting activity happening and and lots of upgrades to come. I think with respect to um, you know, how we got to launch and, and why it took so long and so on. I mean, you know, on the one hand, software developers are notorious for um, poor estimates. So, you know, there's there's Hofstadter's law, which is like, it'll take longer than you expect, even after you take into account half Hofstadter's law. So you get this kind of recursion, um, which is great. We definitely felt subject to that. I think um, we didn't quite appreciate maybe the complexity of what we were building initially. Uh, and a lot of that really only came to the surface as we as we tried to start building it. And there were a few iterations of things where, you know, we just threw something away completely and, and started again. 
Um, and so, for instance, that's kind of, you know, the story of the Cosmos SDK. The Cosmos SDK wasn't part of the white paper. It wasn't really part of, you know, front and center of anything. But we realized kind of as we were going that, um, you know, we really do need a, a, a mature kind of professional framework for people to build blockchain applications in that is uh, extensible and, and can cover a, a wide number of use cases and doesn't lock into any particular, you know, serialization algorithm or Merkle tree structure or any of the things like this. And, you know, prior to that, we kind of had, you know, we had some uh, uh, some kind of a framework. It was called Basecoin at the time or for a while, um, you know, and that was working. We had test nets with that running and staking and, you know, IBC even before the fundraiser in 2017. But the kind of design process for the Cosmos SDK uh, kind of set reset things right, and we started working on a, a new model, and putting um, you know object capability based security first, and and really thinking through you know how much of the Go programming language existing capabilities can we utilize in our security model, and you know how are we going to get the right abstractions, and how are we going to be able to build systems as diverse as the Cosmos Hub on the one hand, and you know the Ethereum state machine on the other, right, with the the kind of Ethermint project, and that was really a a chief design goal that only really became articulated a little later on in the process that this framework we build, we want it to be extremely general purpose so that you could literally uh, wrap the existing Ethereum state machine with its RLP and its Merkle tree and the EVM as is and all the existing clients, you know, not have to change them at all and use the same framework to build that as you would use to build the Cosmos hub. Right. Um, and so that required a lot, a lot of design work and a lot of kind of resetting and you know, rebuilding things that we had already built in terms of staking modules and all this now back on top of this new framework. And so, you know, that kind of delayed things. And then as we were really drilling into the staking model and the fee distribution and all this stuff, you know, um, there's a lot of complexity in there and it's, it's extremely advanced. And I think, um, as far as I know, you know, the most complicated kind of a proof of stake state machine in existence today, um, especially with regards to, you know, the delegation and the, the unbonding periods and supporting redelegation, which has its own set of subtleties and nuances. And uh, through all of that, having fee distribution um, to potentially, you know, many thousands, if not hundreds of thousands or millions of delegators across, you know, maybe a hundred or a few hundred validators. So getting all that to work and, you know, we, we scrapped our fee distribution twice. You know, we, we first had a, a pretty complex one and we scrapped that and did a simple one. And then we scrapped that and did a, you know, a, a different one. Um, and now, you know, things are a lot more mature and stable and we have nice specifications for a lot of it. But, um, I, you know, I, I think to a significant extent, we really underestimated the complexity of what we were building. There wasn't enough specification done up front. Um, you know, there weren't enough people really thinking about the problems and the implementation details and all that. It really only evolved over the course of 2018, right? And then, of course, there are, you know, uh, operational constraints, coordination constraints. We have quite a distributed team from San Francisco to, you know, Berlin all the way to, to Asia at points, um, you know, San Francisco and Berlin pretty much don't overlap uh, at any point in business hours. So, um, you know, coordinating, it, it can be very difficult. Um, and, and, you know, we launched various programs, so we iterated through the test nets and there's a lot of kind of operational overhead to that and to game mistakes, which we can talk about as well. Um, and so just like getting all those things in place and, you know, dealing with all the difficulties of remote um, coordination and so on, you know, so it ended up taking, uh, a little bit longer um, than anticipated. <laughs> I mean, I joke that, uh, you know, it was like we were two months away for like, you know, 15 months or something. And then there was a period where we were like a month away for a couple months. And then we were a couple weeks away for a few weeks. And, you know, then it happened. So I actually have a chart in uh, the Berkeley office that kind of maps this, <laughs> like estimated time to launch. And it's just sort of hovering around a two months mark for like a good like eight months. That's funny. Just the one other point I want to make, and um, Zaki gave a talk at the, the MIT Bitcoin Expo that kind of, you know, really harped on this, um, this approach we took, which I thought was actually really valuable and really interesting. And, and I think distinguishes us from a lot of other projects, which is that, you know, we, we didn't launch the Cosmos Hub until, a, well, I shouldn't say we, the Cosmos Hub didn't launch until a couple of weeks ago, right? Um, but all that time, there were a large number of projects building on top of um, you know, the software we had been developing, some of them even running in production. And, you know, for instance, the IrisNet launched, um, you know, I think a month or two uh, before the Cosmos Hub did. And, you know, Tendermint has been used in production for, you know, quite some time now. And so this approach of like doing everything in, in a, a quite modular fashion and trying to make the pieces as useful as possible in the interim, um, I think really helped kind of build the community and, and develop the ecosystem and the expertise around it. Uh, until we got to the point of, you know, actually launching this, this uh, mainnet um, Cosmos Hub. And so um, I think that was really valuable for us and kind of helped continue the momentum. And, you know, despite the fact that the Cosmos Hub hadn't shipped, 
you know, we were still shipping lots of releases for Tendermint and for the SDK, and a lot of people were, were starting to really see value out of that, um, and, and you know, have been running in production for some time. So, um, you know, I, I, I don't want to neglect that. Yeah, of course, and and uh, you know, obviously, we're all very excited when 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 the launch happened, and so you know, months before launching, there was this uh, this game of stakes, which was sort of like a I guess like a glorified test net where things were happening kind of in production uh and you know being being a sort of like a close observer of of cosmos and a close observer of course one uh i sort of got to see what was happening here and thought it was interesting like that this approach was actually quite interesting and and, and that you know maybe it, it should be adopted also by other blockchain networks that would launch in the future um, can you talk about you know why you did this? You know what was the goal here, and like what you learned from this experience that allowed you to launch the network then so successfully and like so far flawlessly, I guess. Sure. I mean, um, so a big part, a big, a big part of our understanding of what we were doing is that not only we were building software, but we were also building a community of network operators. And when you're talking about proof of stake systems, the kind of expertise required in a network operator is very very different from, you know, a proof of work system, mining, and, you know, the, the kind of full nodes that are running there, um, especially because you have this, this private key online, uh, and you're also concerned with hiding your IP. So you have a, a more complicated kind of infrastructural operational setup, and so on. And so early, I think in 2018, you know, we were a little bit confused, or sorry, um, a little bit concerned about how mature the actual validator community was going to be, you know, by the time launch, you know, which was two months away for <laughs> how, how mature they were going to be. Um, and so, you know, we started to put some real effort into, into building the, um, the validator community and the testnet community. And I think, uh, you know, to a significant extent, this was really, um, you spearheaded by, uh, by Adrian of Cryptium, um, who was working with us at the time. And he really kind of got the ball rolling on this, which, which was really nice. And, and it, you know, it picked up kind of far beyond him very quickly, um, and really became like a, a self-sustaining community on its own of, Kind of running test nets, taking the re latest release and, and you know running it in the wild, and eventually by the summer we started doing these like decentralized starts. You know there were a lot of hiccups at first when you're when you're like uh, you know doing QA on your software with a distributed network of strangers over the internet. It's uh, quite a intensive experience. But um, so we got these networks up and running through through the test nets, and um, and and through that kind of built a community of operators that that really understood how to run the software. Um, how to deal with with bugs and failures. You know, there were lots of halts, lots of lots of things went wrong where people would have to kind of restart the whole network and do that in a decentralized way. And so the community really got a lot of practice uh, doing that through the the series of test nets, um, which I think was was incredibly valuable uh, both for us and for getting feedback and so on, but also for them and learning how to operate and kind of building this this sense of community. Um, but with respect to game mistakes, I mean, th so the other piece that we were that we realized was that there were a lot of people participating in these community test nets that were really valuable community members answering lots of questions, like doing just outstanding work in contributing to the software and so on. But these people actually didn't have, um, didn't have any atoms, you know, they didn't participate in the fundraiser in any, uh, you know, at all. Maybe they didn't even know about Cosmos at the time. And so, you know, given that the plan for the Cosmos hub was that it was going to launch without um, the ability to transfer the atoms, there was some concern that some of the most um, some of the most competent or experienced network operators actually wouldn't be able to participate at launch, right? And so this is where we kind of cooked up the idea that, well, maybe we can build some kind of uh, incentivized testnet competition where the people who are really participating and can really demonstrate their competence uh, can actually, you know, be rewarded uh, with some atoms in the Genesis block, a recommendation for atoms in the Genesis block. Um, and so that if the network starts with that recommendation, you know, they'll, they'll be there on day one and they'll be able to start um, to participate. And that was extremely well received. We had, you know, a lot of support for that. A lot of people participated in the game of stakes. Um, and some of those people who, you know, or some of those validators who received, um, you know, Adam recommendations in the Genesis block, uh, you know, were validators on, you know, from block one um, and have been, you know, huge, again, huge participants in, in the network since its launch. And so game of stakes was really about making sure that, you know, those people who had put so much time and effort and energy into our testnet program uh, and, and weren't going to be able to participate at launch would actually have um, have some atoms so that they could participate. And that seems to have worked tremendously well. And yeah, I would highly recommend that additional, that other, um, you know, proof of stake networks that are launching do something like this and, you know, make sure they're building up this kind of community of, of network operators. Because th at the end of the day, running these networks is really probably about half as much as about having competent operators that really understand what they're doing as it is about 
um, as it is about the software because the software is going to have bugs, it's going to have issues, things are going to go wrong, and you really need you know competent network operators uh, that can coordinate um, to 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 address these kinds of issues. And so, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, just just briefly uh, weighing in here because you know. And uh, now, of course, one had so we we participated, of course, in this in this game of stakes, and we had like an incredibly also stressful and intense like Christmas <laughs> because of that. Because <laughs> uh, I mean, I think you know we had participated in in these test nets for quite a while before, but you know then it would be like okay, something happens, it goes down, it wasn't really so consequential, but then all of a sudden it was like okay, no, this is like a major issue. So then having, you know, building up systems to have, you know, automated phone calls and like on-call schedule and all, like all of that stuff. And, and, you know, initially it started just before Christmas and then it halted a bunch of times and then restarted. And then, so we had basically over the holidays, a lot of, I mean, like many others, I think, like fixing these things and improving it. And then I think what we saw, right, in the, in the launch is that everything went super smooth. And I think that was, without game mistakes, that would not have gone this way. I'm sure lots of validators we've had lots of downtime and in game of stakes we saw lots of downtime of various validators but then since it launched that hasn't happened like that yeah totally and the other thing that it also did like, like you mentioned was a lot of the halts in the uh during game of stakes were due to like bugs in the software and so what the other thing game of stakes really did was it allowed us to have a good process of like test testing uh all sorts of behavior on the state machine and all the validators were trying like different functions and like doing like fun little stuff on the game and that forced us to like test software and things that like in ways that you know we weren't testing it internally ourselves and so that helped us catch a lot of bugs and you know it seems that thanks to that we we it, it we have like we said we haven't had any bugs knock on wood like yet on mainnet the other thing that uh, game mistakes also tried to do, which I'll actually argue that I don't think it did very well, was we also had this, we also had this idea that somehow it was going to uh, test the um, economics of proof of stake. And so what we, and the idea was like, oh, can we like fast track the testing of proof of stake by like increasing the rewards? Like, so the inflation was like, I don't know, something absurd, like 20,000% or something. Over the, over the course of two months. And we thought, oh, that would somehow simulate running proof of stake for, for years. And I don't know, I, I, you know, like I said, like, like Bucky said, like one of the main things was to get validators to test, to set up their security system properly. And I think that that like pits that we're saying, oh, we're testing proof of stake actually degraded the uh, improvement of people's security. So because you'll notice that for, for example, um, my, my validator Sika, we, didn't auto bond any of our tokens like we were not and so we quickly fell out of like you know our stake quickly depleted but that's because we didn't want to practice like we wanted to practice keeping a cold key and not having a hot key with an auto bond script and so i think that like you know having that like testing a proof of stake kind of actually degraded a little bit from the experience so that you know i think as different projects go on and do more like incentivized test nets like this I think these are some of the things that they should be thinking about, really focusing on the security of the validators. Yeah, I, that's a really great point. Um, and I mean, partially it showed that, you know, we could, we could do these kinds of experiments and, the, and they can be successful. But I think, um, you know, to Sunny's point, they really should clarify what in particular they are testing and not try to conflate too many things at once. Um, and, you know, I mean, part of the excitement, you know, that I always had around the blockchain space was that we can really start to test, you know, economic mechanisms and, and things in the wild in ways that we probably couldn't before. And, you know, that's that's more true than ever today. Um, and, yeah, with Game of Stakes, we kind of got a few things, uh, I guess, um, confounded in that. On the one hand, we're, we're trying to really improve operator security. But on the other, you know, we were talking about testing the economics and, and those two things are a little bit um, uh, juxtaposed with each other. Or they're a little bit in tension, like Sonny was saying, you know. You know, auto auto bonding isn't something you should be doing if you're building this kind of you know hyper secure offline key system. Whereas it is if you're just in it for the rewards, right? So, but I, but I think we're also seeing that play out on mainnet. I mean, if you look at significant amount of the transaction activity, is some of the validators just like constantly uh, withdrawing their rewards and rebonding? And uh, you know, maybe that's a, a problem with the architecture of the system that the rewards aren't automatically bonded, and you know that stuff that could be addressed in the future, but. I think this point about picking what you're what you're testing and what you're experimenting with um, is important. Yeah. 
the economics of a short-term game are just so different than the economics of a long-term repeated game. And that's that and I think that was sort of the main problem. And we saw like certain attacks that were tried on game of stakes that only made sh sense in short-term games, not in a long-term game like the real Cosmos Hub is. Well, let's move to the topic of governance, right? Because that's another thing that, you know, since the network's launched, like you still can't transfer tokens, but there is like activity around governance. And one, you know, one of the things that's interesting is in the last years, people often talked about on-chain governance, but they would always talk about, you know, Tezos or Definity or like these other projects. Cosmos would never be mentioned, but of course there is on-chain governance and it's being used today. So do you guys mind describing what does the on-chain governance process look like in Cosmos? And, you know, how does it differ from other on-chain governance processes? Sure. So the on-chain governance process of Cosmos is a little bit uh, complex. And it's like not, it, it's, I, I'd say it's somewhere in the middle ground between like the more social consensus style system of Bitcoin and Ethereum and the more like complete hardcore fully on-chain governance that like Tezos or Polkadot kind of, Say so in Tezos and Polkadot, like you know, they have like a sort of sort of coin holder voting, where the more coins you have, the more votes you get, and that has the ability to automatically change the software. And you know, my issue with this is I think it leaves out a lot of the stakeholders. So you know, coin holders are an important stakeholder in the governance process, but they're not the only one. There are other important stakeholders that you need to gauge the opinion of, such as, you know, maybe businesses who are depending on the system, users, core developers. There's a lot of people who you need to gauge the social consensus of. And that's kind of like, you know, always been the premise of Bitcoin and Ethereum and whatnot, that you need to gauge all everyone's consensus. But the problem that Bitcoin and Ethereum face is that they don't have an outlet for coin holders to signal their views and so this is kind of problematic as well where like um you know the ethereum for example has the carbon vote but it's not this like official thing it, like the ux around it is not that great and it's like so it leads to extremely low voter turnout um and so the idea is that by like making it be like the on-chain governance or on-chain signaling be like an official part of the core protocol the idea is that hopefully we can get more voter turnout and it so we can get the coin holders views as an input into the social consensus. And so if you look at the governance system of Cosmos, there's three types of proposals. There's a text proposal, a parameter change proposal, and software upgrade proposal. So the text proposal is really what I've been talking about where it's this signal. So it's like, you know, we ask the coin holders, hey, do you want this feature? Or what do you think about this idea? And, and the coin holders can do their signaling. Then there's a second round, which is sort of like the um, uh, software upgrade proposals. This is where the question we're asking to coin holders is not actually, is not act this, this is really less of a governance and it's more of just a coordination system of when to upgrade. And so what we're asking uh, people is not, do you want this change? It's, do you think social consensus has agreed to this change. So for example, if you look at a uh, SegWit activation uh, in Bitcoin, right? That whole 80% uh, threshold that they had, the, I don't think 80% of miners wanted SegWit. The question really was, do you think that SegWit was accepted by social consensus? And 80% of the miners voted yes on that question. And so that's really what the software upgrade proposal is. The, 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 we're telling the we're telling the voters here that you're not you're not supposed to be saying what you want. You're supposed to be just providing an oracle to social consensus and saying has social consensus agreed to run this? And if so, let's coordinate on a block height and a code hash to upgrade to. And then finally, there's that middle uh, type of uh, uh, proposal, which is the parameter change, where there's some things like you know high level code changes and stuff. We want to go through this very slow and drawn out process, be somewhat conservative like Bitcoin. But you know, even on Ethereum, uh, there are certain things that like the miners can just straight up change themselves. For example, the gas limit or block size in Ethereum. And so that's why we have these parameter change proposals where it's like some things that maybe just for the case, for the situation of simplicity and efficiency, we'll say, okay, we'll let the coin holders just automatically upgrade that themselves. But the, the, the things that are going to be in that camp are probably going to be somewhat uh, limited. So really, the, the, the text proposals and the software proposal, this two-round system, 
is really going to be the crux of Cosmos's rel- the Cosmos Hub's uh, relatively conservative governance system. So we've had uh, two governance proposals so far, right? One was about changing some parameter about how inflation and the block rewards calculated. And the other one is around enabling transfers. You know, what are the insights or maybe lessons that you guys see so far in terms of how the governance system uh, is functioning? Is it kind of living up to expectations? Do you guys feel like some things have come up that surprised you? Yeah, so... You know, the second proposal that was made on the Cosmos Hub, the first one was about this, like, uh, thing that it was relatively uncontentious and it seems to be passing quite well. Uh, The second one was about, you know, the famous activating of transfers. So, you know, as Bucky mentioned, we launched the Cosmos Hub without the ability to run, uh, without the ability to transfer tokens. And we kind of said it'll be up to the community to decide when they think that activating transfers is ready. But the way that that second governance proposal was kind of framed, it was framed in a in a in a suboptimal way where it basically said, do you want to activate transfers? And if so, we'll all run the code that is signed by uh, AIB, all in bits or Tendermint, the company. And basically, essentially, like, you know, Tendermint, the company, essentially, they said, like, it was based off of the signatures of three key base accounts, which I think included Bucky, Jay and Jack, who is the uh, project manager for the SDK. If it has the signature of these three people, then we'll go ahead and run that code. But that's, and no, that actually, for for a little bit, a lot of people voted yes. And then some people started to think about it a bit more. And they're like, wait a second. That means that like Tendermint, the company could like do anything they want. And like, we could, we could change the state machine to like, do, you know, do anything we want, allow, send all money to us. And, you know, obviously I work for Tendermint, the company, and I, I, I hope, I don't think we're malicious, but like, I think it set good precedent that the community was like wary and skeptical of us. And so now in the past few days that the, the vote on that proposal has quickly shifted to no, and that proposal will probably be rejected. And there are people in the process of writing a new proposal for enabling transfers that follows this more two-round commit system that we uh, just talked about. So one of the interesting things in the um, Cosmos voting system is that, you know, if, let's say I'm a delegator and I'm delegating to, you know, validator A, then if I don't, vo- if I don't vote myself on a proposal, I basically vote in the same way that validator A votes, but I have the ability to say, oh, I'm, I'm going to vote myself and then differ from the way my validator votes. How do you guys think about that in terms of the sort of power balance between validators and delegators? I mean, in many voting systems, on-chain governance voting systems, we've seen very low participation from token holders. So let's say we're going to see similarly very low participation here. Do you see a risk that validators will have too much power in this? Yeah, I, I think potentially. Um, I think, uh, you know, first of all, this is all a massive experiment. So we, we don't really know how any of these things are going to shake out. Um, the nice thing, though, is that, that having this kind of um, automated governance uh, for delegators, um, basically, you know, it, it does help guarantee. I mean, it, it's kind of double edged on the on the voter turnout question, because on the one hand, by having the automated, um, the automated voting kind of follow your delegate, follow your validator. Um, you know, we basically guarantee that as long as the validators are, are voting, which they ought to be, then all of the stake is kind of coming with them, which leads to high turnout numbers. Now, whether or not the individual delegators are, are kind of paying attention um, is kind of another question. And I think it it really depends on it depends on who the delegators are and, and what what they care about and, um, you know, how how technical they are and how how much they kind of understand the state of the network. Right. So to the extent that they're just you know, retail consumers that are looking for some kind of passive return, you know, then then they're not going to care. And at, at least in theory, right, they're, they're not going to know enough to pay attention. Now, I think we've we've kind of hoped and, and tried to, um, you know, encourage the community to be such that the, such retail investors aren't really the primary holders of atoms. Uh, you know, the other parts of the Cosmos network will be for them. The, the hope is that really the, the people that hold atoms are people that are uh, quite, quite interested and involved in 
um, the, the maturation, uh, the maturation of this technology and, and the network and, you know, they're building businesses around it and on it and so on. And so want to see that even if they're not a, a validator themselves, that the network is evolving in a direction um, that makes sense for them as kind of active um, stakeholders, right? But the extent to which they'll be active really depends on the extent to which there is opportunities for them to be active outside of just being um, a validator, right? So building businesses and, you know, putting up zones and, and all this kind of other stuff on top of Cosmos. But um, so I think there is there is some risk. Um, a lot of it remains to be seen how this is going to work out. You know, again, it's a big experiment. I mean, there have been discussions about uh, potentially changing the that governance. So, you know, um, so that maybe when you delegate, you also have to pick um, which validators votes you'll follow rather than automatically following the validator you delegated to. Um, so that could kind of make things a little bit more flexible and, and, and could, could potentially separate the um you know, the decision between who you want your, your stake to be tied to and who you want your vote to be tied to, which could be very different. But I think, um, you know, it, from a certain other analysis or perspective, it might make sense for those things to be the same. It doesn't even necessarily have to be to another validator. It could be just to another user account as well. Could be to another user. Right, right, right. So kind of make it more of a liquid democracy kind of approach. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of opportunity and flexibility there. I think what we've started with is just kind of, you know, again, from the perspective of actually shipping the thing and having it not be too complicated from the get-go. You know, the idea was, well, let's ship the kind of simplest thing that, that makes sense and that kind of works uh, and let it evolve from there according to, you know, the stakeholders and the users of the network. So uh, it'll be very interesting to see how the governance really evolves from here. I think that this flexibility is 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 desirable and perhaps necessary, and I think that having something more akin to a liquid democracy is is an improvement or some sort of betterment uh, in in terms of what uh, you know our actual you know, current political systems look like but I think the challenge remains regardless of you know this sort of flexibility is is participation and, and encouraging participation now you know, it might be that you have all these all these functionalities and these features that allow you to delegate etc but that in reality you know maybe two, Big whales are only act. Uh, only two big whales are actually coming in and making decisions on on important proposals to the network. And if at some point you know there are billions of dollars in value and user applications and investment funds and insurance companies and banks and what have you building on Tendermint, then you know that could potentially pose a risk to a lot of users. Uh, you know, one idea that that you know we were discussing before the show, Brian and I, and one idea could be to potentially that delegators. Um, would um, would need to actively delegate their vote with validators, but that those validators' votes in, in, in a pool would only count if a sufficient threat hold, threshold had been reached. So eff effectively, validators would sort of have to campaign on behalf of their delegators uh, in order for votes to go through. And so therefore, you might have a situation where like people would be incentivized to vote, et cetera. How, how do you think that you know, we can actively sort of you know, make, make blockchains a sort of more democratic system where there is actually participation and we don't fall into the same sort of system that we have now where you know, most elections, I think, you know, like never surpass 50 percent. And like in recent elections, we've seen like, you know, even less than that. This is a really hard question. And I don't know that any of us are going to be able to give like real competent answers. I think to some extent we're exploring um, extremely uncertain and unknown territory. Um, what, I, what I would say is that, um, you know, to... Uh, it, it really depends on the stakeholders and the community engagement and, you know, how much people care about the system and, and want to participate. And to some extent, it will also depend on the incentives, but, you know, building the incentives around governance in a way that doesn't just promote vote buying and all this stuff is, is, is quite difficult. Um, and so I think, you know, and, and part, again, part of the vision of, of Cosmos was really um, this sovereignty and this, you know, proliferation of blockchains and that any group of stakeholders that wanted to put up a chain would have the tools to do so and to do so in a way that was, at some level interoperable with everything else, right? So, you know, whether they're talking to the Cosmos Hub or not, it, it kind of doesn't matter. And so from this from this larger, um, you know, meta perspective of, of giving people the tools to run blockchains and to engage with them and govern them, um, I think that that will hold a lot of promise in this question about, you know, how do we build actually engaged communities and, and um, you know, stakeholders that, that participate. Uh, but I think it, you know, it, it's also still an open question for us as, you know, civilizations and societies, how we build these kinds of um, institutions where there is kind of democratic engagement participation. And, uh, you know, we don't really have that 
at a large scale in our, I think, in our in our politics. There are certain other, you know, like cooperative corporations try to do this a little bit more actively where, you know, the members kind of have to vote. And that, that's kind of the whole point of being part of a cooperative is you're supposed to vote on the thing, right? And so you can think of some of these digital networks as like, or some of these blockchain networks as like digital cooperatives in a sense, but, you know, it's, it's very experimental. And so I think it, it really comes down to um, what is the value to the stakeholder that they're getting out of this and how much do they care? And if they don't, if they simply don't care enough about the outcome that you know they're going to vote, then they're not going to vote, right? And so you know the the closer that the actual state machine of the blockchain is to the particular stakeholder, the more likely they're going to pay attention and they are going to vote. And so you know this kind of thinking, I think, has been um, paramount in, in our design decisions to you know in, in encourage this proliferation, to not have the kind of shared security by default, but to have you know more of an interoperability by default and, and and sovereignty by default to really enable. Um, the state machine to really be as close as possible to the stakeholders so that they will care and so that they will turn up. And I think asking the question of, you know, how do we get all of the atom holders to vote on things on the Cosmos Hub or how do we get all the Bitcoin holders to vote on things on Bitcoin, you know, it, it's a little bit of a misnomer because of how distant the state machine of those networks is from the stakeholder, right? Um, and yeah, so kind of a, a long-winded way of saying, you know, it really depends and we don't know. <laughs> Also, a couple of weeks, uh, like earlier on in like the Cosmos Hub development process, we actually had it so that if you like, you know, uh, sl if a validator doesn't vote, they actually got slashed. Uh, but then what, it, you know, the emergent behavior that ended up happening is everyone just started writing scripts that would auto vote abstain. And, it, you know, I, I think what that made us realize was trying to force behavior especially when it comes to voting and stuff is not effective. And really what we need to do is inspire and encourage people to vote. And I think that that is like, you know, this whole community blockchains idea is kind of will hopefully do that. Where like, you know, the reason maybe people don't want to vote on a lot of the Ethereum stuff is that it's like, you know, it's just such a big system that like you don't care about everything that's going on. Right. But like if it's like a more specialized application or part of your community chain or something, you know, maybe that will lead to more engagement. And then from a technical standpoint, there's also like, you know, some certain stuff that I've been working on to make it easier to, for people to vote. So for example, right now, um, you need to vote using your key that also, you know, has all your atoms on it. And maybe you want to be keeping that in cold storage. Uh, I'm working on a uh, proposal called sub keys, which will allow you to like basically designate one key as like, like a, for different functionality. So you could and one of the things you could do is you could say this key has only the ability to vote in governance and it can't like move your tokens to someone else. So it's okay that maybe that you have your main key on your ledger in cold storage, but like your governance key, you can keep it on your phone. And there's like already a bunch of great uh, mobile wallets like I, uh, Rainbow Wallet and Cosmos Station and, that already support governance. And so once we have these sub keys, you can keep those keys on your phone and be able to vote, you know, we'll, we'll make it like fun. Like, you know, you, when you see another Cosmos holder, Adam holder, you'd be like, hey, have you voted on the proposal yet? And like, you know, well, you know, we gotta encourage people to be part of it and make it easier and more secure for people to do it as well. So we've spoken a bit about uh, validators and, and of course that does tie into governance as well. So what, what do you guys see as the role of validators in the long run and the kind of the, the function they serve in the network? Uh, sorry, I just, I just wanted to make a point about, about the, the last discussion, which I think is that uh, this point is about kind of voter turnout and engagement and, and that it's maybe the wrong question and it's more about building systems that people care about and, and getting the engagement there. Um, kind of holds for the larger space of mechanism design and, you know, all the kind of things we're working on. We always, we tend to take very, you know, uh, technically oriented and mechanism oriented approaches to the design of these systems. And I think to a significant extent, you know, somewhere along the line, neglect the fact that the whole point of this thing is to coordinate, you know, real, wet, humans. messy humans. Um, <laughs> and that the human elements are, are, are really what this is all about. And, and, you know, if we don't tend to the psychological and sociological aspects of that, um, no matter how perfect your mechanism is on paper, um, you know it, it. It might not really, um, might not really take shape the way you expect. And you know, I was at the the radical exchange uh, conference last week with my girlfriend, 
who is much more in the kind of the social side of, of, of things and, you know, how to make technology more human side. And she was basically just trolling me the whole time we were there and just chirping about, you know, all these people are so like mechanism oriented, like where's the humanity and all this. And so, you know, I try to channel her as much as possible in thinking about blockchain design and so on. So anyways, uh, from the perspective of validators, I mean, I see, um, uh, I would, I'm very interested in this is a much, this is a long-term perspective. So I'll just give it to you like that. Um, I'm, I'm looking for a uh, radical decentralization of the physical infrastructure of the internet. Um, because right now it, it's kind of a red herring or it's kind of the, the no, sorry, not a red herring. Um, it's the elephant in the room. Get my analogies, my idioms mixed up. The elephant in the room when we talk about decentralization is the, is the physical infrastructure, right? Because we have made almost no progress, you know, we're doing uh, really great things on decentralizing file sharing and consensus and, you know, all these, all these great software and overlay stuff. But when it comes to the physical infrastructure, um, you know, we've hardly even begun. I mean, there's a few mesh net projects and so on. But uh, so what I really see in the long term, um, the validators as being the seeds for real decentralization of the of the Internet infrastructure. And I think, you know, validator like proof of stake validators might be the first application uh, where people are going back to data centers, right? Like everything moved to the cloud and it's like finally we've created an application that is encouraging people to actually uh, leave the cloud and actually set up real physical infrastructure close to them, um, you know, in uh, in a data center. It was actually, I found this uh, quite touching the other day. I was, I was talking to Zaki, you know, Zaki travels quite a bit um, and he was, you know, we, we, he said something about like where home is, like when are you going to go home? And he was like, where's home? And he was like, oh, home is where the validator is, right? And I thought that was uh, that that was kind of really um, really interesting take on the meaning and importance of validators in the long term as like seeds of the physical infrastructure, the physical internet infrastructure for these new kinds of digitally cooperative communities. Um, and so, you know, maybe that's not a satisfying answer about what the role of the validator is in the short term. But at least, uh, you know, that's what I'm kind of hoping for in the long term, that they really start to seed uh, physical infrastructure in, in local communities and that, you know, this vision for, you know, sovereign independent blockchains that are all kind of interoperating um, kind of takes a, uh, to a significant extent, like a geographical orientation so that, you know, uh, certain zones actually are based locally, geographically. And, you know, traditionally, that's how, that's how sharding is done on, on the traditional internet, right? With, um, you know, the, the huge volumes of, of Google or whatever get cached in local data centers to serve those populations more efficiently than having to always go to California to get the data. Um, and so I'm hoping that, that we can, you know, reset the internet infrastructure on top of that kind of thing um, with validators. Now, in the short term, what's the role of the validator? You know, it's very different. It's obviously primarily to, to, to operate the network and, and to, to host it and to start to offer services around it and to attract delegators and, uh, you know, upgrade it and make it actually useful for a larger number of stakeholders. But I think to ask about the role of the validator, you know, just the validators on the Cosmos hub, uh, you know, kind of misses the point of the larger vision of the Cosmos network and, and the Cosmos interchain of, you know, the, the validators are really part and parcel. They're like the stakeholders of the independent communities that we expect to run the many millions of blockchains. Um, and so, you know, part of that is going to be educational. How are these communities actually going to have the technical expertise to actually do this in a way that just doesn't, you know, doesn't just offload everything to some other, um, you know, tech provider. And I think those are, uh, you know, interesting questions and challenges for us to address um, over the coming, you know, years, decades. So one of the interesting questions around validators uh, that's also already come up in the, you know, two and a half weeks that it's running is around, you know, the decentralization and of course we do have, let's say, for example, Polychain, where right, has like a huge, so there are some of these funds with like massive positions. There's an expectation that like exchange is going to come in and, you know, in, in some other systems, they've also, uh, like in EOS, for example, I think they've accumulated massive power. Coinbase custody is now, you know, they're going to launch a validator soon. So how, how do you first of all think about like, what's the role of decentralization in the Cosmos hub? Is there some kind of metric? to measure it and yeah how, how do you see this playing out good tough question um i don't know uh you know uh, very early on in the development of tendermint i think at least a couple researchers were driven to the brink of insanity by virtue of the fact that you know tendermint under the you know formal analysis collapses to just two dudes right one with 99 percent of the stake and one with one percent of the stake um and I have I have seen minds in the throes of this kind of analysis, and it's it's I don't encourage you to go there. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean it, it's a hard question, and I, I I don't know the answer. I mean, hopefully the the community of stakeholders and and you know atom holders will um, will cherish and value decentralization. 
Uh, and if they don't, I suspect that there will be some that do and ultimately, you know, create forks um, or alternative global hubs where things are a bit more um, decentralized. Now, there probably are things that can be done in protocol. I think, um, you know, these are difficult. There's a lot of discussion around them about what you can do there to really to really push for it. Um, you're always at risk of, I think to some extent, maybe, you know, it's been um, uh, uh, underestimated the cost of having like independent validator IDs. And so, you know, we could, you could propose things like a cap on how much could be bonded for a particular validator. And that would force people with large positions to split their validator up into multiple keys. And if they're being public with both, then they're publicly, you know, civil in some sense. Um, and so I don't, you know, so, so I think things like that could be experimented with. Um, I don't know, uh, you know, I'm certainly not going to necessarily vouch for any, any one solution or the other. Uh, I'm interested in seeing kind of what the will of the stakeholders really is and, and the people that have atoms and distributed. And we certainly won't know what it's going to look like until transfers are enabled. Um, and, you know, a much larger group of interested parties uh, can kind of get involved in this. But um, it's definitely a threat and it's definitely a little risky. But I will say, I will say this, which is the difference between a service uh, hosted by a single entity and a service hosted by four or seven, you know, 11, whatever it is, even a small number is, is very significant and uh, very different than what we've ever had before, right? And so even just this moderate amount of decentralization in the short term over some number of entities, especially if they're geographically distributed in different jurisdictions, um, I think is very significant. And we shouldn't, we shouldn't underestimate the, the value of even that small level of decentralization. Of course, hopefully we'll push for much, much more of it over the long term. But it's already extremely experimental and, and quite unprecedented. And so, you know, I would take some amount of pride in, in that initially. One solution that I will vouch for is, uh, you know, for how to help push more decentralization is this one that Dan Robinson and I and Vitalik have been talking about for a while, and other, a bunch of other people as well, called partial slashing, which is the idea that a, the larger a validator is that faults, the more they get slashed. And then... Um, you also take into account there's the me there's ways you can design it such that like even if if a validator tries to split into m many smaller validators and they all double sign or fault together they get like slashed even more than if they didn't split and so you can design incentives where it's like encourages validators like from an economically rational standpoint to help decentralize the network and not put everything under you know into centralized systems so go, going further on this topic, uh, this is something that's come up recently uh, and uh, something that we, we felt it would be a good, good to address, spe specifically because, uh, because you know, we're talking to you, Sunny, is um, you know, this position of adopting low commissions as a validator. So your validator uh, has uh, adopted this policy of 0% commission, and there's been some amount of uproar on social media and on Reddit. In fact, we, you know, posted a Reddit uh, uh, post uh, in, before this episode asking people to, to ask questions. And I think two or three of those were, you know, around this topic. Um, and so in, in, a, in a sort of capitalistic uh, a paradigm, uh, one would think that, you know, everybody would try to bring their fees as low as possible. And, and then the, 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 the bigger validators, the ones with the most economic means could, could sort of out competition the rest of the market or out compete the rest of the market uh, to uh, to effectively you know lead us to a situation where potentially there's a lot less decentralization and maybe there is just one or two validators um, now of course as um, as a decentralized system we want to encourage you know I think people and validators specifically not to adopt this sort of this sort of policy or this sort of like you know zero percent commission so how how do you how do you respond to that and like wh why did you do this um, and you know, what's what's the reasoning behind it and you know how do you address that in the context of decentralization and and also as a tendermint employee uh, I feel that you know you have a, a particularly you know, vested interest in tendermint succeeding so how do you respond to all this like, yeah so Sika we this is the name of the validator that's run by myself and Dave Oja who's another. Uh, Tendermint employee, um, he, we basically decided to start with 0% commission and for the short term, right? Like, so w w when we when we announced it, we said we're doing 0% commission for at least one month. Um, and our goal was to help, you know, I think what the, we saw a lot of the commission rates that a lot of the validators set was too high. 
And I don't think it needs to be that high. Like we saw some validators up at 15%. While I agree, 0% is too low. And so the idea was, we, you know, we want to, you know, both sides to start moving towards each other so we meet somewhere in the middle. And so I think Sika has been doing this very well, where by for using the 0%, we've already forced a number of validators to reduce their commission. Very few validators have reduced it to 0%, which was never our intention. Our intention was just to force people to reduce it downwards and towards something that we see is more reasonable. And I don't know what the number we see as reasonable is yet. Like, you know, I don't think it should be too much higher than 5% in my opinion. Um, but you know, that was kind of the goal there and we'll start to increase our validator, our commission rate there. Um, and then two other things that are kind of relevant here is why are we able to do this 0% commission? A lot of people have been criticizing us that we're like price gouging or like, you know, we have access to insane in mind. So like VC capital or something like that's how we're doing it. We have like zero VC funding or anything. Uh, literally what we have is our, 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 um, validator is running out of the UC Berkeley data center, which, you know, through uh, Don Song, who works on Oasis Lab, she was my advisor at UC Berkeley. And so she got us into the uh, UC Berkeley data center and we are running our validator out of that, which is why we're able to run our, our highly secure validator for very low cost. And, you know, I, I, I fundamentally don't see this as any different than the miners who decide to mine out of Iceland using their free geothermal electricity, right? you're going to have to expect that the validation market will become like competitive and people who can find the most efficient ways of like extracting resources will succeed there. And finally, the last thing is, you know, we're also taking a much more longer term view of the Cosmos network where the Cosmos hub is not the only chain in the system. We're charging 0% on the Cosmos hub to earn delegation and reputation and like, you know, some name, name branding. And then, you know, within this or next week, we're going to start running a validator for the Iris hub. And we're not going to be charging 0% commission there. We're going to be charging a commission rate there, a non-zero commission rate there. And we're going to hopefully use our brand that we've been building as like competent, high functioning validators on the Cosmos hub to earn more delegation on the Iris hub. Yeah. So, I mean, this is a, I think, very interesting discussion. Uh, and obviously, I, I've been involved in this discussion quite a bit. I, I personally find the argument super questionable that you're making. Like, for example, if we if you look at some math here, let's say the Cosmos, uh, the Adam market cap is a billion, which is a lot, right, for the stage of the project. But, you know, maybe it will be there. If you have 5% commission across all validators, it means 5 million revenues uh, across all of the validators for paying for the entire infrastructure. So if you have a hundred validators, that's on average $50,000 per validator. It's not even one job, right? Like not speaking of running the infrastructure. And then Wait, if you have on. like- 5% be 50 million, not 5 million? No. 5% of a billion is 50 million. No, but you have, you have a billion, right? And then you have like, let's say roughly 10% inflation per year would be a hundred million oh. revenues paid to all the delegator. 5% commission would be 5 million. Split across see, okay. 100 validators, there would be 50,000. Now, of course, you don't have a uniform distribution of the stake, right? So it basically mm -hmm. would mean that, like, you would not be able to have more than five, 10 validators that maybe could be, like, financially sustainable. So I think it's... Now, from your guys' perspective, I can totally see the argument. I think it's sort of economically rational, but I think it's extremely negative for the for the Cosmos ecosystem. And I personally think, and now this is a little bit strange because I'm also the interviewer here. <laughs> I also think it's totally irresponsible to do it, especially getting like paid by all in bits at the same time as a salary and then doing this by competing with everyone building a network. I think it's so messed up. Hmm. Okay. I think that, you know, like I said, I, I have no intention of keeping it at 0%. Uh, and also, well, that's I even think more that messed up to, to do it zero percent, not tell anybody, and then later like hike up the price. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I think they, they told people that it was just going to be a month, right? Yeah. Yeah, and I told people that if I, whenever we raise the prices, we are going to give at least one bo unbonding periods worth of uh, notice. So people will have three weeks, and if they don't like our announced price uh, commission rate increase, they can instantly redelegate away and be out of us completely 100% before we ever increase our prices. And then also, 
using the numbers you said, like this is like taking a very short term view of the network. Keep in mind, atom inflation is not even meant to be a reward for the validators. It really was designed to be a system just to punish people for not staking. The real long term reward in the Cosmos Hub system is going to be the fees that you earn from the system. And yes, I understand that right now the, there are the fees are essentially negligible uh, because the system is brand new. But like. You know, people were doing this in the early days of Bitcoin. People were mining off of the faith that like these things will one day be valuable. And this is kind of what we're asking the validators to do as well. Have some faith in the system and believe that like, you know, at some point the usage of the system, the fees will be enough to like uh, pay, pay for the services that you guys are providing. Okay, well, I think this is a, a discussion that, you know, is probably best continued in, in some other context as well. But so let's let's move. So, we, we, you know, we're running pretty late already, but let's move briefly to the, you know, Cosmos SDK and IBC, uh, especially Cosmos SDK, which, you know, I think is, uh, you know, it's a key uh, part of the Cosmos project and the kind of the value proposition. So Bucky, do you mind like, running through like what's the, the vision of Cosmos SDK and the utility of it? Sure. Um, I think maybe to really understand that, uh, you know, from a from a lower level, if you're already familiar with Tendermint, it helps just talk briefly about the Tendermint ABCI. So, um, you know, Tendermint was designed in such a way to abstract the state machine from the replication engine. So when we talk about blockchains as replicated state machines, you have a state machine, you have the replication piece, which is all the, you know, the peer-to-peer, -peer, the consensus, etc. Um, and so what we did was we invented this interface that we call the ABCI, the application blockchain interface, that abstracts away all the concerns of the state machine from the underlying replication engine. And that enables you to build your state machine in any programming language you want, uh, to use existing code, you know, uh, to architect it however you like. It runs in a separate process on the same machine, on a different machine, kind of doesn't matter. So there's, you know, tremendous flexibility there. And I think that's been part of why Tendermint uh, Core, the software, has been so, you know, so widely adopted. Um, but when you're building directly over ABCI, it's a it's quite a, a low level interface, right? And so there are a lot of concerns that you have to kind of keep in mind and take care of things like concert, concurrency and state management, and um, you know the the structure of your modules and, and and all this stuff. And what we realized is we had built a few different applications in Go to kind of test this out. Um, that there were a lot of common elements there that all these applications shared. And so what we did was we 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 created another layer of, or another layer of abstraction to really um, you know, simplify all of those concerns so that you could now build, uh, you know, more directly just the, the key pieces of your state machine without having to think about any of this ABCI stuff, right? And so the Cosmos SDK was really designed as, um, as a framework for building applications in Go uh, on top of Tendermint, right? So for building state machines on top of Tendermint. Um, and the way it's structured, it, it kind of comes in these layers, right? And so the lowest layer, it's called base app, is a very, it's, it's really a thin wrapper around um, the ABCI that gives you this kind of, um, uh, you know, very flexible approach to how you should think about the state that you're storing in your state machine um, and, you know, how transactions are going to are gonna access that state or manipulate that state. And this is where the, you know, the key design principles of, of the Cosmos SDK of object-based capability um, security come in where you know, you, the idea is that things are only gonna get access to the store if they're given uh, you know, an explicit capability that enables them to access the store. Um, and so kind of the, the whole model of the base app is designed like that, but the base app is still uh, flexible enough that you can, you know, it doesn't force a particular serialization algorithm, it doesn't force a particular Merkle tree, doesn't force you know, any notion of coins or anything like this. It's very, very general purpose building a state machine on top of the ABCI using this object capabilities based approach to um, accessing your state, right? Um, and then from there, there's this next layer, which is, uh, you know, the the actual, um, what a lot of people know is the Cosmos SDK, which are all the kind of uh, pieces of like the coins uh, and the anti-handler and this particular way of structuring transactions and having, uh, you know, certain kinds of signatures and nonces and fee collection and, and all this kind of stuff. Um, uh, which, you know, the Cosmos Hub was ultimately built on, right? And a lot of other things that, you know, maybe they won't look the same as the Cosmos Hub, but they'll still use a lot of the same structure for what transactions are like and how they're serialized and so on. Um, but the, and so, that, so that's, that's kind of the, a lot of the pieces that you would need to actually build, um, you know, a cryptocurrency or a cryptocurrency system. And then on top of that, then there's the next layer, which are the actual 
uh, the modules, right? And that's where all the really custom logic for executing your transaction comes in. So after you've done, you know, all the authentication stuff, you make sure, you know, people have enough to pay their balance and they sign their signatures and so on, then you want to actually get into the meat of your application logic and that's where the modules come in. And so, you know, for the Cosmos Hub, there's a certain set of modules that are, you know, that define the governance of the Cosmos Hub and the proof of stake and the slashing and the fee distribution and so on. Uh, but if you're building another, um, you know, a different kind of application, you could choose a different set of modules. So you can still inherit, you know, everything underneath. So the same kind of transaction format and all this kind of stuff, but you can start to define more specifically, um, you know, the messages, the message structure, uh, and, and the kinds of state transitions that are involved in your, in your application, uh, and so on. And to the extent you want to use the same governance or the same proof of stake module, you can. Uh, to the extent you want to change those, you, you know, you can as well. So again, the SDK is really this kind of general framework for building uh, cryptocurrency style state machines on top of Tendermint, where there are multiple layers at which you could enter, depending on kind of what you want to inherit and how much flexibility you want to retain. Cool. Now, w one question that people often have is, you know, the, the difference between Substrate, uh, which is a kind of similar framework developed by the Parity team and Cosmos SDK. What do you think are the look at yeah, the main the main differences here? I haven't gotten too much time to play around with Substrate yet. I've poked around it a little bit, um, and you know, it seems that you know a lot of the design ideas are actually generally very similar. Like they're using a similar idea of modules and like different t transaction types and stuff. And really at the end of the day, I think it's really just gonna come down to people's preferences for programming language, where uh, Substrate is written in Rust. And you, you know, if you wanna build your state machine, you have to do it in Rust, while the Cosmos SDK is in Golang. And you know, we have another framework that was also built by some uh, engineers who used to be at, at All In Bits and now have spun off into their own company called Nomic, called Lotion JS, which is a JavaScript JavaScript based SDK essentially. And so, essentially, you know, the idea is that we want this like diversity in. Uh, in, in frameworks. In fact, there's actually now the fourth one called Weave, which is, uh, uh, Bucky mentioned like a while back ago that like, you know, we had an old version of SDK V1 and we kind of scrapped it and started writing SDK V2. Well, one of our ex engineers actually really, really liked SDK V1 and he actually kind of went ahead and kept maintaining it and kind of turned it into its own standalone SDK called Weave now. And so, you know, the idea is that we want all these different frameworks in the uh, Cosmos ecosystem, whether it's the Cosmos SDK, Weave, Lotion, Substrate, and give developers the opportunity to like use whichever one they feel most comfortable with. And it's really going to mostly come down, in my opinion, to the programming language. I think that, you know, in my personal opinion, I think Rust is a little bit too esoteric for most uh, developers, while JavaScript is maybe a little bit too loose. And I think Go hits this like nice little middle balance mm -hmm. between like, you know, security, especially with our object capability system that we design mm -hmm. along with uh, ease of use and ease of access to uh, developers. Like, you know, I learned Go in like two days. It's, it, it's really easy programming language to pick up as if you have like basic programming experience. And so, and you know, the real goal would be is we want to implement IBC in all of these different frameworks. So right now we're working on it in SDK, but you know, we're going to have it implementations in all of these different frameworks. Yeah, so that that does bring us to the next topic that you know maybe you can briefly cover. I know it's in its very beginning, but Bucky, I know there, there's some work starting around IBC. So what's you know what's the the current status on IBC and uh, like what what does the IBC roadmap look like? So I mean, there had been um, past specifications of IBC and past kind of prototype implementations that were running on test nets and and, and so on. Um, what's happening now is we're kind of taking a step back from all of that and trying to really split the IBC spec apart into all of its uh, constituent pieces and really for each piece define, you know, what it is, what are the properties at this layer, um, you know, what are the requirements to satisfy, you know, the, these particular needs and so on. Um, and so you can follow all this work in, the, in a GitHub repository. It's github.com slash cosmos slash ICS. That stands for interchange standards. So cosmos slash ICS. And you'll see there, um, you know, a large number of issues. They're each numbered like ICS number three, number four, et cetera. And each of these kind of corresponds to a different component of the IBC uh, layered stack, right? And um, and so so activity there is really starting to ramp up. Um, we're also hosting a biweekly meeting with with a, a larger group of members from the community who are interested in 
um, participating in the IBC discussion. What we'd really like to ensure is that you know IBC is defined in a very uh, general purpose way and has a you know a specification that really focuses on um, you know some of the key data types, but also kind of the properties and the requirements of the protocol, so that um, it becomes very easy to implement it in many different languages. And we have intention, at least you know right out the bat, to, to implement it in, in three different languages: in Go, in Rust, and in JavaScript, and to have those implementations actually pursued by um, by three distinct teams. Um, and so we're working, you know, both the, the Interchain Foundation, uh, you know, is working on implementation in Rust. Uh, Alden Bits is working on one in Go. Um, you know, we're, we're trying to work with the uh, Agoric team on one in JavaScript and also the Gnomic team who has pieces of it uh, already in JavaScript. Uh, and so, you know, we're, we're really trying to make, it, make sure that we don't say overfit um, the design of IBC to a particular state machine or to, you know, particular needs and that it really stays uh, generic enough to suit the needs of a, a, a large number of stakeholders who are looking to have their state machines interoperate, you know, in this larger Cosmos interchain vision. Um, and so if people want to follow that, again, github.com slash cosmos slash ICS. Um, if you're interested in, in the bi-weekly call, um, I, I actually don't know the best way to find it, but it is all, uh, you should be able to find it from the repo. It should be able to join publicly. Um, and so that, that's moving along. And hopefully, uh, you know, we hope to have MVP, at least of, of the spec, um, you know, in, in the next few weeks. Um, of course, I'm going to start making estimates, so you shouldn't listen to my estimates because they're almost certainly wrong. <laughs> but, you know, ho hopefully IBC will be in a place where we can actually ship something to the Cosmos Hub, you know, um, this year. Uh, you know, beyond that, more more refined timelines are, are really hard to give. Obviously, we want it as soon as possible because that's, you know, really what's necessary to realize the Cosmos vision, but we want to do it right. We want to make sure um, the specification is, is written, you know, quite formally and, and is very clear and is amenable to implementation in, in multiple languages. So why should someone choose to build their, their DAP or their application on Cosmos rather than Ethereum? Well, uh, potentially a lot of reasons. So um, if you want direct interoperability with the rest of the Ethereum ecosystem, then obviously you should build on Ethereum. Um, if you want to subject yourself to immense development pain in um, you know, using Solidity and debugging your Solidity contracts and so on, uh, you should develop on Ethereum. Uh, if you want to subject yourself to the whims of the Ethereum governance and to you know Ethereum's fee system and mechanism and and you know proof of work mining and all this stuff, then you should develop on Ethereum. If you want kind of independent sovereignty and if you want to use a, a, a mature programming language that you've been building in for a decade and has mature debugging tools and testing and, and all this stuff, um, then Cosmos is, is probably right for you. So you mentioned the Interchain Foundation, and so this is the foundation that uh, led the fundraiser. Um, can you talk about the role of the foundation moving forward with regards to Cosmos and Tendermint and like all these different projects and organizations gravitating you know, around Cosmos? Yeah, so um, you know the, the foundation was set up in early 2017. Um, it, it did this fundraiser. It has been the primary source of funds for um, you know, many of the folks kind of involved in developing, um, you know, key elements of, of the Cosmos Hub and, and pieces of the Cosmos Network. Um, I think now that uh, a number of organizations are kind of standing on their own two feet in the sense that they've managed to raise uh, venture capital investment, so that includes all in bits, but it also includes a number of other um, entities. We're starting to see staking companies, you know, raise VC money and so on. Um, a lot more attention is starting to turn to, uh, you know, building up the Interchain Foundation and, and um, building up teams there and, and ramping up uh, the granting program and so on. Um, so, so right now, really the focus there is on um, this granting program. So you can find it on the website, interchain.io. You can apply for funds. Um, so we're looking to, you know, uh, in, in the short term, really um, deploy capital, deploy, um, you know, funds from, from our treasury, which has been, I think, reasonably well managed over the last couple of years. Uh, to really, you know, grow the ecosystem and see uh, in the short term to see kind of the immediate needs be developed. So, you know, IBC for sure, certain other application frameworks, um, bridges, things like, uh, you know, bridge to the Ethereum network, things like Ethermint, which are, you know, um, the Ethereum state machine running on top of Tendermint in a way that's compatible with the Cosmos network, uh, you know, certain, um, certain wallets and block explorers and so on. So really kind of growing this, the set of applications and frameworks and developer tools and all this. Um, for building, um, for, for building, you know, out the Cosmos ecosystem. Uh, the foundation is also starting to focus on on some R and D as well, kind of uh, a little internally. So, um, you know, as I mentioned, uh, the foundation is going to take on the 
um, implementing IBC in Rust to kind of complement AIB doing it in Go and others in JavaScript and hopefully others in other languages too. Um, and so, you know, we're looking to hire Rust developers for that. Um, we're also uh, building up the research team there. And so we're starting to focus in really on formal verification of hopefully all of the protocols in the stack, but really uh, I think starting from Tendermint, starting from the lower lowest layer and kind of working our way up uh, and to help, you know, really ensure the correctness of the software and, and to um, enhance our ability to test it and, you know, really build confidence in the software, both for the Cosmos Hub, but also for all the many other blockchains that we'll be building, um, you know, on Tendermint. And then, you know, hopefully we'll be able to turn our attention to um, actual actual protocols in the state machine, in, in the way staking works and governance and so on, and, and try to move the bar on, on formally verifying things there. Um, you know, in the long term for the foundation, I, I think we'd like to, we'd like to figure out what sustainability really looks like for a nonprofit. I think that's something that hasn't really been um, hasn't really been addressed in this space. You know, a lot of a lot of foundations are sitting on you know a huge stock of capital and feel like their only job is to um, appreciate the value of the assets they sit on. I think that's maybe a little bit of a, you know kind of a naive view and, and kind of the thinking that got us into you know peak oil crisis and stuff like that is like oh we have all this stock now we can just spend it. It's like no, we kind of need to figure out sustainability, um, and the sooner we do it, probably probably the better. So we're starting to think about what that looks like. Um, but we don't really know yet, so you know if, uh, we're eager to hear what what people think, and um, and uh, you know we're building out there, and hopefully there'll, there'll be a lot more to say from the foundation um, in the short term. But really, the focus is on on funding, you know, building out the, the community, and having you know really having strong independent members of the larger Cosmos ecosystem that can really take responsibility for you know operating the network and, and developing things on it, and and so on. Yeah, cool. Well, thanks so much, guys, for coming on. It was uh, it was great, uh, you know, diving into Cosmos. I'm sure this is going to be something to revisit and lots, lots more to uh, to discuss, especially as actually interoperability uh, is going to, you know, start to happen, right? And we will actually start to have, you know, multiple interconnected blockchains and a whole new world of you know what blockchains look like and blockchain networks look like i think we're starting to emerge so thanks so much for coming on it was a pleasure thanks for having us thanks for having us we release new episodes of epicenter every week click here to subscribe for hundreds of insightful interviews with some of the leading minds in blockchain and crypto you can also listen to the audio version of the podcast on itunes spotify stitcher and other podcast apps click here for a full list of places where you can listen Thanks for watching Epicenter, and we hope you'll join us for our next episode.